Yeah, I think we'll get started. It's past four o'clock in Copenhagen. So, and yeah, we're about 50 live. So that's very nice. Hello, everyone. Um, great to see you. Wave. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's about mold today. And uh, it's uh, funny how uh, a topic like that this week has just uh, come very near to me. So uh, I had a, a visit from a doctor in Iceland who uh, has somehow, uh, it's like sometimes we don't choose our patients, they choose us. And she has been uh, kind of chosen to help them with their mold problems um, in Iceland. So uh, it was very, very interesting speaking to her and like discussing how we can support further and how, uh, how she in Iceland has a very, very important voice in regards to mold. The second thing that happened to me this week is that um, I have a, a son who's 20 and uh, he, of course, like everyone else who's about 20, wants to try and find their own uh, house and home. And uh, so we were out looking at a place and I could smell something. I could smell something moldy. And uh, so now we're looking into uh, if there's mold in the place because it's an absolute no-go, as you know. So, um, and also as Graham will um, convey today's talk as well about mold, how bad it really is. And if it's there, how we should tidy up and how we tidy up our bodies if we have been exposed. So anyway, that's just my uh, yeah, experiences from this week. And um, I'm Anne Catherine, co-founder of Nordic Laboratories and DNA Life. And as usual, uh, remember all the tests that we talk about, uh, supplements and so on, you can find in your practitioner profile in the VMS virtual management system. I hope that some of you have noticed the new pop-up function that we have created that this uh, last week has been saying that you can create your own journal note templates. Uh, with your own, uh, you can put the picture in of your um, logo of your clinic and uh, make it personal um, so that when you release it to the patient, the patient can see your logo. Um, so try that out. If you need help, reach out to your uh, contact person. Um, you can contact us through uh, the help and support function uh, on uh, VMS. So please use that. It's so neat to have the journal notes in the same place as you have test results and as uh, you have uh, your supplement uh, orders or even if you make the prescriptions handy. So Graham, it's uh, time. Okay. For you to talk. Oh, good. Thanks for a great <laughs> intro. I'll mute and uh, admit all those who are joining when you start talking. So the stage is for you. Thank you. I will share my screen here and uh, then just move this into presentation mode. Okay. So yeah, we're going to be touching well on the huge area of, of mold today, uh, mostly around the, the test options and, and the advantages, pros and cons of the, the different tests. So we'll get started and get going. So, of course, uh, yeah, mold is a type of fungus and it, it typically thrives in damp environments, so buildings, cars, food, and all of us, of course, on this on this call will um, will be here because we realise that uh, it can really impair health by secreting toxic metabolites and becoming invasive infections. Um, and of course, there's there's ongoing research in this in this area, but we we still don't know so much about mold um, and it's still like many things in many topics that we talk about in functional medicine there's, there's there's still a long way to go in making you know raising more awareness and understanding and of how to yeah test treat and, and deal with some of these really complex cases so i mean the first thing to to say is that in regards to mycotoxins, one mold species may produce many different mycotoxins, 
and several species may produce the same mycotoxin. And it's really these which, of course, cause many problems for, for us humans, especially. Um, but biotoxins from mold, they can cause a wide range of symptoms. We've got very classic things like fatigue and musculoskeletal issues, asthma, neurological symptoms, neuropsychiatric symptoms, issues with vision and balance, and then can be often vague and systemic uh symptomology and you know, also many many other symptoms as well and of course sometimes it's referred to as biotoxin illness so it's not always easy to to pick up a, a toxic mold case especially if you're you know, one of the first practitioners to help your your client or patient with yeah, these these symptoms um so I think the, the first thing is to try and put on your, your detective hat, so to speak. And um, certainly at yeah, Nordic Clinic here in Stockholm, we generally will consider mold testing when um, yeah, residents of the same building or co-workers are experiencing symptoms. So of course, we're structuring the questions in the, if you like, the first meeting with the patient to ask these yeah around these different areas so you know, did, did anyone else have the same symptoms as you do um do you feel worse at, at home or in the office is it all the time so we want to know things like was the onset of the symptoms around the time the first uh, yeah they first started spending time in a building so maybe they've they've moved home or maybe they've been living away for various different reasons and then a, a really big i think good key question to ask is do do you feel better if you spend time away from that building of course it's been a bit harder to answer that during the pandemic because of course patients aren't traveling as much so it's uh, so it's harder to answer of course very classic one do, uh, is that visible mold in in the building do you live in a climate allowing for for mold growth of course we've been originally from the uk i mean mold is rampant in um, uk houses and then of course you've got immunocompromised patients if you if you work with them you should definitely consider mold as a, a possibility to, um, to to causing them issues. And then, if you've ruled, I mean, generally ruled a lot of things out. So, so what we'll do if patient comes to an appointment, and there might be a lot of different symptoms which we we just went through. That doesn't necessarily mean it's it's mold. Um, so if there's no obvious answer to these questions here like with time spent in uh, time spent in a building you know, residents or co-workers same symptoms you know, symptoms getting better from being away visible mold um etc then usually we would we would kind of leave mold um until later on so we'd go through and rule out many other things all the things we would normally do we'd be looking in the GI tract, we'd be running perhaps nutrient deficiency tests, etc. Maybe even other infection tests like reactivated viral infections. So for me, mold it comes a bit more further down the list when it's not clear if it if it is mold. I'm going to want to rule other things out first before we start to, to touch on this. Now, of course, the good thing with, with some of the tests that we offer, like um, the organic acids test uh, that comes from Great Plains, that, that does have some mold markers within that test. So also we can get some overview of a, a general screen test if there is poss yeah, possibility of, of mold being an issue. So really, I think key if uh, you know, key to, of course, any consultation is to to try and ask a, a good range of questions and ask the right questions to, to help to identify where, where you need to go with, with the testing. So in, in regards to mold testing, I would say broadly speaking, there's, there's three different legs, if you like, or three different areas. We've got testing for exposure. We can do something like an organic acids test or 
preferably the mycotox panel, and these look for mold metabolites in the urine. Then we have immune reactivity. So we've got very you know, common classic antibody testing, and then we have T cell reactivity or Ellis spot test. And then of course you have testing buildings and there you want to work with a yeah, professional mold inspector company. And uh, that's of course not something that, that we at Nordic get directly involved with, but of course, different members of the team have different recommendations depending on which country you're living in. Uh, so sometimes we can we can help with that as well if you if you need it. So the I guess like the, the more like entry level test would be to run the organic acids test and on the, the first page of that report here, uh, if we look down the yeast and fungal markers um, numbers, two, four, five, and six here can indicate possible as, uh, aspergillus. Um, so if there's high levels, two, four, five, or six here, then you certainly might consider mold as a, a possible cause of, of symptoms. And then number nine, so this um, uh, trichobalic acid can indicate fusarium, and another species of mold. So again, we, we get back to organic acid testing is really fantastic because it does cover a, a number of areas, but you specifically want to run this organic acids test. So the, the one that's called organic acids uh, testing in our system, which is uh, driven by Great Plains. And that's the one where you're gonna get more indication of it. So that could be a first level investigation. Um, but if you yeah, really want to go all in with the mold metal metabolites testing, then um, of course the, the mycotox profile uh, is the, the, next, the next step. And it screens for um, 11 different mycotoxins from 40 species of mold in, in one urine sample. And this is basically how the, the results look. It's a very simple report to understand if um, yeah, it's either in the the green or red area. And of course, like this one here, we've, we've got an, an indication that there is mold exposure and um, more investigation needs to take place. Uh, so with the mycotox profile, it's very simple. Um, yeah, tell them 10 milliliters of the first morning urine before food or drink and uh, fasting for 12 hours can increase excretion of mycotoxins from the adipose tissue. And like I said, it's very simple, yeah, kind of green or red answer that's going to tell you if there's something going on there that, that needs to be um, more deeply investigated. Now, you can also run a, uh, a mold antibodies test. So we have these in the system as well. Uh, and of course, immunology is very complex, but to keep things kind of simple, what we say is usually if there's an elevated IgA response, then it's a recent exposure. Of course, IgE means there's mold allergy. So especially if your uh, client or patient has like simple nasal congestion, watery, watery eyes, mild cough, um, even to more severe reactive airway disease and asthma, then mold should perhaps be considered. Um, so these, again, when you're collecting your intake questionnaire information, if you gather that before the, the patient actually comes to see you, you know, what I'm writing down, if there's things like nasal congestion, watery eyes, mild cough, and of course, it could be allergies to numerous things, but then we're gonna hone in on the, the, the questions further, like, okay, when did this start? Um, and see if that links to any kind of building exposure. So if you, if you run um, an IgE or IgG or IgA test, it just simply looks like this. And of course, the, um, basically the, the red scores indicate a raised response. So, IgA recent exposure, IgE, there's actual an allergy to mold, and then IgG, that's mold sensitivity and or past exposure. 
Um, so this is how to yeah, think about roughly what they mean. Um, and uh, so you, you may be that you may find an IgG response to mold, but it but it might be yeah old past exposure and that's not concerning at the moment. So again, pros and cons to the different tests. You know, the um, so the antibody testing is certainly it's cheaper than if you're running the, the metabolomics profile like the microtox, but it also can be limited in the information that you that you get. Then we have uh, Ellispot analysis. So if you've not run Ellispot testing before, it stands for enzyme-linked immune absorbent spot. And it's basically a measurement of the response by T cells when they are challenged with antigens from a pathogen. And then we get this secretion interferon gamma that indicates recent exposure. Um, and of course, uh, you may have been yeah, following various things with uh, COVID and Epstein-Barr and other infections, like Borrelia, for example, because how immune responses can change over time. And it may be that, for example, uh, you need to run an L spot over something like a, an antigen test to, to really uh, get, a, get a good answer as to what's, what's going on. So often when we suspect like chronic infections um, that's potentially been going on for a long time, we, we often will run L-spot testing for essentially a, a variety of, uh, of infections, possibly including mold as, as well. So if you don't know uh, the principle of L-spot testing, I've included a slide here. And of course, everyone will, will be sent a copy of the, the, the presentation. Um, but this is how it, how it works. So if you want to learn more about that, you can you can go through the uh, yeah, go through the slide. Um, but I think the Alice spot testing is is very interesting, and again, you you might want to consider coupling this with with the other tests as well, um, because there are, as we discussed, pros and cons to to each test. So when um, so of course the, the challenge is if you if you have a patient that comes with suspected mold exposure. If you are just going to go back through here, but if you're using the antibody testing, um, you you may not get a good result on this test, or it's going to be limited with its its information. If they're not allergic to mold, um, sometimes always the IG, IgA response isn't necessarily elevated. Um, then you need to use something like an L-spot analysis or, of course, even, even better, the mold metabolite. So I think really from a perspective of which, which test should I run, if you definitely want to look for, for mold exposure, my preferred test is to run the mycotox profile. Um, but depending on your, your patient's kind of funds and resources, I might start with a mold antibodies. And if I wanted to be very thorough, then I would um, yeah, probably run a combination of all three tests. So I'd run mycotox antibodies and L-spot analysis. But again, the L-spot, it only covers like aspergillus, for example, it's not a full mold mix. So still, I think the, if the, the best test here is, is the, um, the mycotox profile. If you really want to, to screen effectively, it, it does the most markers. So if, um, if you've, you've got a patient, uh, you've asked them a number of, of questions and those answers to those questions are indicating that, all right, the, there is really a high suspicion of mold where it's been, especially if it's been visible, they've developed symptoms after moving into that, that building. Um, then you're, you're gonna run one of, one of these tests uh, if, you, uh, yeah, if you want the, the data to, to, of course, back up what's, what's going on. And then we get a positive result like we did on the mycotox profile before or the immune results we've just gone through. You've got to talk about how do we now start to actually solve this? And of course, this is complicated enough in itself. Um, so 
what what we usually think about is kind of seven uh, seven areas to remediate mold toxicity. You want to think about binders uh, and promoting elimination. We've then got the actual remediating mold induced cytotoxicity. We've got detoxification conjugation. If mold is in the intestine, we want to out colonize it. Then there are nasal sprays, prescription drugs. And we also have, we want to optimize the immune response as well. So, um, so I think it, one of the, the first things that if we suspect mold, um, I start to ask the patient about, okay, what are the possibilities that they could like renovate the house or they can have that investigated? Because I think um, if it's going to be very difficult for whatever reason that they are going to be personally responsible and are going to be unable to do anything about the house situation, then that's uh, yeah, we're in a tough situation at that point because ultimately you're really one of the, the main focus here has to be to eliminate the cause of, of the mold, which classically is coming from from the building in in some way so always want to make sure that the patient can do something about it otherwise uh, we, we can go on and do the testing and we can try and manage the situation but it's going to be difficult if that source of mold is continuously there we're, we're not going to be able to you know, solve the issue long term so that's a, a conversation with the patient. Of course, if they're, if they're renting and the landlord is responsible, that's easier. Um, and a bunch of other situations where it can be easier to get solved. But it's important that I know that the patient's going to be able to make the changes to their property to, um, to get rid of the source. So let's say we've had that, that conversation. It, it's definitely um, a possibility. We're going to start to, yeah, we do the test. It's positive. Okay, we, we have some good answers. We know what's going on. So in regards to um, what we found from the test will then depend on what, what I'm going to use. So you can see the, the different mycotoxins here. And then there's different bind uh, binders that may be more beneficial for, for different mycotoxins. So of course, everyone will get a, a copy of this. Um, so here are the different options, but it can be silica products, activated charcoal, chlorella, pectin, bentonite clay, probiotics. Um, so you could, yeah, possibly all, all of all of these yeah, can be used. So you, you want to look at what what's the mycotoxin that's been found, and therefore what is potentially the better binder to to be used. So first of all, we want to use a binder and um, to, to obviously help to bind things in the, the digestive system, these mycotoxins and help to pull them out. And we want to promote elimination. So also we want to think about fluid intake and optimization of gastrointestinal function. So even though maybe someone is going with suspected mold toxicity, um, one of, again, the first areas that I'm going to be thinking about from a practitioner perspective is how well is the gastrointestinal system working and all other systems that affect that system, because we're going to need to optimize that to help to eliminate out um, these, these mycotoxins that, uh, of course, are really raising the immune response. So really... Uh, focus on these two things and then select a, a binder that's appropriate. Um, and these ones here are, of course, mostly um, yeah, supplemental products. So there is a medicinal as well, uh, which I'll come to a bit later on in the, the, the presentation here. So the first thing would be to use, use binder, help to improve elimination. And then in regards to detoxification conjugation wise, so typically you're going to be using the glutathione, NAC or something like Brocolox because of the, the sulforaphane component, which is going to stimulate glutathione and other cellular defenses. And then we've also got the alpha lipoic acid 
Um, then, uh, so it might be using you know, one or two of these, maybe more really depends on the case and how bad the symptoms are, how much support we, we think that they need. What do we see in some of their other tests, which indicate like on organic acid, acids test, the need for glutathione support. And then I'm going to start to try and remediate mold induced cytotoxicity. So the two components which have some research behind them, so resveratrol and quercetin are two that you can use. But of course, because of the reactive oxygen species that are produced, other antioxidants could, could work well as well. But we, um, we prefer we go for, the, go for these two at, at the moment. <clears throat> then to out-colonize intestinal mold, uh, these are the, the species of probiotics that have some backing behind them, typically lactobacilli. Um, so we're going to use a, uh, yeah, a, a probiotic that, that has uh, a number of these or all of them, if, if possible, um, alongside the other treatments we've just gone through. Then uh, we will use nasal sprays as well. Um, so one spray I'm a big fan of, certainly as we're, we're getting through the initial parts of the protocol is the RG3 nasal spray, um, which in mouse model has been shown to help reduce brain inflammation. Uh, so I really like the, the RG3 nasal spray, but first we'd probably be going in with something like the Argentine 23, to, to combat mold in the nasal cavity. So be using that alongside the, the binders, alongside the antioxidants to, to help to kind of, as well as the intestinal probiotic to, to basically try and just combat mold activity uh, that, that are in those, those key areas. Oops, sorry. Um, then if you're yeah, working with a medical doctor or you are a medical doctor, then uh, cholestyramine is quite a well-known binder that, that can be used also in mold situation. There's antifungal drugs. And then actually for nasal mold, there are medications. So one here, um, uh, amphotericin B, and then also acetylcysteine. Um, that can be used to help to break down mucus as well, typically as a, a nasal spray. So some of our doctors will use these in combination with a number of the supplements for support as well. Um, and then also in order to optimize the immune response, then two research nutritional products that um, we like to use, so multi-messenger, because of course with things like infection, it can drive down the TH1 status. Um, and it can affect innate immunity. So we will use multi-messenger as a support and sometimes also transfer factor and viro. Um, but again, you may need to, with these, of course, these, if we go back to the start here, um, you know, these seven different circles, it may be that you have to start with just with improving binding and elimination first um, with something that's manageable for, for that patient. You may have had to work on you know, dysbiosis and maybe um, other uh, yeah, dysfunctions with the GI tract and then start to yeah, move down the list. So using a binder, promoting elimination, then supporting detoxification dealing with the reactive oxygen species, and then you know, out-colonizing intestinal mold, potentially out-colonizing nasal mold. And then, yeah, if you yeah, have a, a medical colleague or are a medical doctor, maybe you're gonna choose some of these options in, instead. And then also optimizing the, the immune response. So it, it can be quite a heavy supplementation plan, but you're gonna to have to work with your individual patient in front of you, see what's possible, but this can take, a, I mean, it can really take a long, long time. 
you know, you're, you're also got to solve the building issue as well. Um, so it's by any sense, it's not a, it's not a simple process uh, and it's complicated. And I can't sit here and say we have all the answers because we don't. Um, but we've yeah, seen definitely with the removal, the effective removal of mold from a building and supporting with these steps of, of uh, binding, et cetera, that uh, patients do improve, but it, but it takes a long time. And of course it, it may, it can possibly manage, manifest as, as SIRS, uh, again, depending on how long it's going on, when they've got this kind of chronic immune response syndrome going on. Um, and they are really difficult patients to, to work with, no, no simple solutions. But um, it's really nice when you, you do find a clear example of mold and you, you can work through these steps and uh, yeah, symptoms why I see that, that patient improve slowly over time. So uh, that's our kind of, well, my like whirlwind introduction into uh, yeah, mold, how we think generally speaking about uh, yeah, how to test for mold, what the benefits, pros and cons of the different tests, and then how to think about if it is positive and the building can be, can be treated easily, then also the, the treatment options after that, I think. The worst case is when patients say, well, even if there's mold or there is mold in the building, but I, I can't afford to, to do anything about it right now, I'm stuck. So then we can just, all we can do is trying to support them with the, the different supplements or approaches there to try and do our best until it gets into a situation where they, they can do something about the building. Okay. Okay. So if you want some questions, is that we can open up for a, a yeah a Q and A. So um, working with the limbic system is also a now I just went away from my screen a clue <laughs> um, to to help uh, these patients. Um, I don't know if you have any experience with that, but I do know. I was at um, IFM. Oh, let me just get this. I have it right next to me. Just a second. Um, it was. Uh, it's Annie Harper that I. We were listening to a um, a lecture with Annie Harper, who uh, has what's called the dynamic neural retraining system. She's also written a book that's quite easy to understand, but she's exactly one of those where she had to move uh, to a houseboat, like three hours drive from everywhere. Um, and then she, in order to just be, so she was very isolated and she, she was not a doctor or nutritionist. So she didn't have the biochemistry like angle into this, um, but she had exactly the uh, like, uh, uh, what's it called like mental uh, knowledge because she was a or she is a um, psychotherapist uh, in that area so she has created this plan where you kind of retrain the brain and the limbic system and there's some quite amazing stories with uh, her group um, and and you can read some of the cases in her book but where people if they had done the course with her which is just a, a, it was just like a, a four or five days call course then they could certainly tolerate being uh, with other people and they were much more much less sensitive so working through the limbic system and, and working through uh, the brain and emotions and like um, retraining the brain for sure is uh, uh, an important thing as well. It's uh, hard work and the program, I think it requires uh, one or two hours a day, um, but uh, that's for sure something uh, that's, that's worth looking into. There is also a guy, his name is Dr. Gupta. He's in Harley Street in London. Um, he has a program as, uh, as well that is similar um, and then, um, have you been reading the questions while I've been talking? No. <laughs> there was one with the visual uh, contrast uh, test. 
Uh, for those of you who don't know, the visual contrast test is something you can do online. Um, you, uh, you kind of like adjust your screen so that it fits with a, I remember I did it with a credit card so that the test, the visual test is, is, is the right size. And from that, if that can uh, like say if there's a high risk of um, yeah, mold uh, and mold uh, toxicity. Um, if so, but you can just, that's good. You can Google it and then it doesn't cost very much doing that test as well. Um, so that's another uh, neat tool to have in our functional medicine toolbox kit. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I'd say that also, well, we, we see that we've seen a lot of patients that thought they had mold toxicity and it's turned out not to be. Um, I think Borrelia falls into the same category as well. And there's not, there's obviously genuinely people who have you know, Borrelia infections and, 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 and mold like biotoxin illness, I'm not, not discounting that at all. But, uh, but I still think that, um, yeah, some people get so hooked on some of these uh, like Borrelia or mold. Uh, and a lot of the time we, we do, when we just go through our kind of standard process of working th through things step by step, we actually find they, they get a lot better and it's, and it's not necessarily mold or Borrelia. Um, so again, you just want to make sure that you really you know, do, do a, do a thorough job and, and really try and come to a, you know, rule other things out first, if they've not already been, been ruled out. Um, but yes, the, uh, the, the limbic system work as well. The, the problem that I found with that is that it's difficult for, like you said, Anne Catherine, uh, you know, it often requires an hour a day. Uh, and that's difficult for, for a lot of people to find. So um, a question has come up a couple of times, like, which is uh, the question time, like how long time do you have to be exposed? And, and I think, um, I guess it's uh, uh, yeah, a question of how your body, because you, you, can, you, can, you can be two people in the same household and then one suddenly starts reacting to something and the other one doesn't. Um, so, but, but you might, may find out that both people are exposed to mold. So again, it's like, how does the immune system respond, but also how well do we detoxify? So let's say I'm a poor detoxifier, detoxifier, then I would retain the mold toxins where if the other person is good at detoxifying, whether it being through the gut or um, then they may not get symptoms. And then of course the whole immune uh, question. So, but I, I mean, throughout uh, time, there's like kids that they go to school in a mold environment, that's enough for them. And maybe they're only there from eight till two and, and they're not in the same classroom or where the mold is. So, but there can be reactions um, with headaches and fatigue and just like moody and uh, like runny nose, runny eyes, irritation. And as soon as they are away from it, then they clear up and, and feel much better. Um, other examples is like uh, work um, places where the, there's like a sick building syndrome where there is where mold is, is one of the issues where you go to work, but you, you don't necessarily have the time to start feeling better when you come home and then next day and then you go to work again. So you have to like, again, evaluate, is this my work? Is it my home? If you feel better when you're uh, away on, uh, on holiday. So um, that's of course uh, like questions to, to consider as well. Um, so, so the time is, is, is difficult to say because it's, it depends on the person and, and, and how much mold they're exposed to and, and how toxic uh, the, the mold is uh, as well. So um, I think that's my comment to time. You've got comments to time. <laughs> I think, uh, like you say, it seems to be very dependent and some people can be exposed to a, a lot of mold and, and be fine. 
I know there's not not you know much smaller amounts. So probably I mean like uh, Richie Shoemaker, Doctor Shoemaker, who's doing a lot of research in his genetics that he talks about, which make people more susceptible than others. Um, and uh, I mean, of course, the question is well. When we're walking around all the time, we're, we're exposed to probably mold constantly, whether in the city or, or even in, in nature. So the, the, there's always a certain challenge to the immune system. But um, again, not sure, you know, don't have the answers to these kind of questions. What, uh, what of course, then suddenly flips it and means there's uh, a very strong reaction. And like you said, Anne Catherine, maybe. It can be a whole variety of things from detoxification capability, maybe mold load, type of mold, you know, again, elimination, digestive system, immune function. So <laughs> a bit of complexity as per usual. Exactly. So another question is how long time does it normally take for a person to feel better when away from the source of mold? And it can be a weekend away with some friends that, oh, what happened here? I suddenly, or it can just be away from the school and then in the evening you may feel some clearing up or it may be longer time. But again, it depends on how toxic is the mold, how much is it, uh, have you, um, and how are you, detoxifying and how is your immune response and and so on to it so it's it's very it's very uh difficult to see um i think and the question is mold could be trigger epileptic seizures i mean we it, it could it's not uh unthinkable at all because uh it it can be such a, a hefty impact on the body with um and, and how the immune system is reacting and then we know how the brain and nervous system and immune system is is interlinking so if it's a real true uh pro provo thing that provokes it can cause really bad things and and it can be um like it can be it can also be like uh, fibromyalgia symptoms um pain fatigue chronic fatigue syndrome it can be symptoms like that as well um so it's it's it can be quite uh, evil uh, having a challenge like this and actually i was just um in regards to some of the um uh like the bredesen uh, research they were looking into mold in regards to um, dementia and uh, Alzheimer's, and uh, they've just done another pilot in their um, uh, like line of, of, of pilot studies in regarding to reversal of cognitive decline. And um, what I have heard, and uh, it hasn't been published yet, so it's just um, from um a presentation that he that was done is that uh, they, the last study they did was 25 people and three of them didn't have a reversal in the cognitive decline and these three people were living in moldy homes so they're thinking when they do the next pilot they're gonna actually if, if a person needs to be included in the study and they live in a moldy home they have to be able to move to somewhere else so that they're not exposed to mold that's how bad uh, mold can be also in um yeah in in, in some of the uh, alzheimer's uh, um yeah diagnosis uh, criteria <laughs> so um yeah consider that as well how how bad how it can have have that impact as well how can you differentiate between a past and a current infection from the test um so um, I've had a few patients where they have done the test and it's like the first test they have done. And I can't say if it's a current exposure uh, or a past exposure that hasn't detoxed. So the thing with, um, with uh, mold toxicity is that if you can't, Get rid of it. So there is, a, if if you want to also look up a, a Dr. Showmaker, who works with mold toxicity, um, 
he he's uh, I was one at one of his lectures and he's like describing how it can just recirculate within the internal hepatic pathway so you just keep reabsorbing the mold toxins if you do not uh, excrete it um, so you so so again we can't say when was it and when was it not um, at least not from the mycotox test but it's quite interesting so I had a, a small patient a, a young boy who um, the parents knew there had been mold in the house and they, he had had rash and uh, uh, runny, irritating eyes and runny nose. And uh, so they did a test and um, they, they got the mold removed and they, they did all sorts of detox on him um, with mild, um, like uh, mild binders and like uh, charcoal activated charcoal and also like uh, BUCD and so antimicrobials as well for for any uh, yeah anything that's living there in, in the in, in the intestines and um, so then they did a follow up test. And so this is a concern here. So you can see the mold that was high on the test uh, has now gone down. So something is for sure uh, being eliminated and coming out of the body. But there was a new one. And I was like, before I spoke to the mother, I was like, oh my God, what's now this? Now I have to explain that it's gone to the next. And lo and behold, when we are having the consultation, the mother says that they have had another water leak. Uh, in the house and very, very quickly it started smelling. And so, and it just fitted with this uh, new mold. So it's, um, it can be a bit of a dance, uh, but uh, that's just one of my patients where we, we worked through that. But then we just have to, again, remove the source, um, clean up the house, uh, avoid the exposure and keep supporting the detoxification uh, and immune response over time and how long time it can take. I, I have found this emoji also on my telephone. I don't know. <laughs> um, so have you found something that you wanted to uh, So uh, did, did we answer this? Do, I think you touched on this, that mold would trigger epileptic seizures. I mean, we, we've I mean, we've had a patient where mold was triggering like narcolepsy. Um, so it was very clear that this kind of narcolepsy started when the, the, the uh, child was going away to, to boarding school um, and there was visible mold in the, in, in the school. And we, we ran the tests and uh, we actually ran, a, as well as the metabolomics, we ran a, a DNA adducts test and also found um, yeah, DNA adducts to mold as well. Um, so I think, like you say, it can cause a wide variety of, of factors. Then you've got to work through all the evidence and rule things out as as you as you go. Um, would would exposure to mold effectively clog detox pathways and make other toxins, hormones, excess worse, e.g., endometriosis? Um, I mean, if it had a, <laughs> clogging the detox pathways, I'm not sure that uh, I think they can be more more challenged. But um, I, I, uh, I'm not sure that they it, it would essentially clog up the detox pathways. Obviously, if they were totally clogged up, people would would not be able to would not be alive at all. But um, I think, of course, uh, yeah, the, the the mold load, and then if someone has are having kind of biotransformation issues, etc. Then uh, that's made worse by mold exposure, obviously affecting the immune system, reactive oxygen species, yeah, immune activation. Then I think, of course, other more other systemic issues can can get worse as well. Um, so yeah, yes, I would, I would say that it, 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 it any kind of in, inflammatory condition could be made worse by yeah, a negative reaction to mold. That was also a question of if it can trigger autoimmune disease. And, um, there is, if you look into, uh, again, it's this, it's when the immune system is overloaded, which can happen from environmental exposures or it can happen 
from the gut, gut dysbiosis or gut infection. So it's this overload of immune response that we know can have uh, a trigger on autoimmune. And very often you see uh, in these patients with uh, severe mold uh, toxicity that they also have uh, Hashimoto's or uh, um, yeah, other um, autoimmune conditions like uh, uh, arthritis and pain uh, as well. So um, someone with lichen planus, would you test for mold? Um, uh, probably not my first go-to test, but I would perhaps evaluate like what's the story and like what's the what does the time like timeline look like? Do they have uh, past experience with mold exposure and, and feeling worse and, and, and so on? So um, then, oh, a question comes, and I, I can't actually re reply that exactly. So one is on guagum as an alternative to cholestyramine. Uh, if, if that came through, I didn't see it. So um, I don't have experience working with guagum um, as an alternative to cholestyramine. From my understanding, and maybe it's, isn't that they, they don't work exactly the same way, um, but uh, yeah, but I, but guacom does bind cholesterol, so you would think that it does bind uh, something. Do you have, have experience with your guacom for? Not not no. not, for, not no. using as a binder in that that way. I mean the only I mean clinically where we use guacom is uh, sometimes with rifaximin treatment in in cyber cases there is also um for everyone out there who hasn't seen the uh, webinar with uh, and it's in nordic vm or in vms as well uh, under uh, education you can see all these uh, webinars there and there is one on uh, mold toxicity with uh, dr shaw who has created the mycotox test and he's he's he goes through each of the molds on well not not each but most of them, and he if you listen he mentions and brings up what what could be used for this, um, but uh, activated charcoal is for sure one of those that is uh, like a very like going through most of the uh, mold if they are up high. So um, for sure use that it's cheap as well <laughs> as well. So I think uh, we have been, oh yeah, that was one about uh, mycotoxins in furniture and clothes, etc. I think if you have, and it's this like how extreme should we go? And again, it's, it, it's at an individual level. Um, so let's say you move house and you bring all your furniture that has been in the same room as the mold, then you may be bringing uh, mold spores and dust where the mold is in and then so it, it goes to how extreme you want to go when you move but if you really want to cut it then uh, yeah don't bring it um, but then the question comes to well old pictures uh, old I had one with uh, like uh, old records like vinyl records should I bring that, that. Um, like, but, and that it, it really has to be a, uh, yeah, and evaluate it uh, individually how much they can bring and not bring and can they leave and can they not leave and can it be cleaned and can it not be cleaned. Um, but if you do become, you do end up being a, uh, like a, uh, like you don't like to be in the environment where it is and it can be very, very stressful knowing that you are in an environment that is unhealthy for you. Um, so you have to take it at an, at an uh, individual level. And that's true, uh, air cleaners, um, ozone uh, cleaners and so on can be uh, and, and, and uh, something you can use for cleaning if you can't get out uh, of the house so that you try and, and also you get, um, you can get buildings or builders in and, and, and do the house and then you can move back into it. Uh, so there are different ways, but it's of course the, the patient has to evaluate what at what level they have to remove the exposure. 
Yeah. So uh, if mold spores ever lose their toxicity, I can't answer that. Um, I'm sorry to say. Um, but anyway, I think we've been, there's lots of questions. Um, the video will be sent out to you. Also check out the mold video. Oh yeah, Shania did a mold video as well. Um, so there's actually, this is gonna be the third mold uh, video uh, in VMS if you uh, look out um, in, in there. And again, next month, we are gonna be on the webinar again. What, what is the topic next time? Oh no. Oh no! <laughs> we will let you. I knew you, know. you were gonna. I knew you were gonna ask that. <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, yeah, I have to look it up. You will. You will get an invite. We send out the recording and we send out the slides, and right there, the um, the topic of next month uh, will be as well. I think maybe it's infections. I think it is. Might be. Maybe. Might be. Could be. We haven't covered it yet. Um, <laughs> For sure. No, we, we've got a variety of, well, yeah, different ones like metabolomics coming up and yeah, infections. So metabolomics sure in, in one for November and one for December. Infections and metabolomics. That's what is going to be. I'm quite sure of that. And then we are, of course, planning uh, next year's uh, events as well. February is, is booked out. That's going to be on nucleotides. Um, so we're going to have some focus on some of the supplements uh, next year as well to pull that in so that you can get more uh, knowledge about our huge range of, uh, yeah, uh, 15 nearly 1500 different supplements um so i think i think they deserve uh, some time as well for you to get to know them a little bit better so anyway reach out to us if you need support check out that really neat nice um journal note function uh, that's how i do my journal notes with all my patients and it seems to work very, very well. Just click a button and it's released to them. And uh, you can say you don't have to release, you can keep them secret if you don't want to release your journal notes um, to the patient. So um, yeah, uh, reach out if you need support. And as usual, uh, my aim here in, I think in life is now just really to try and support you as much as possible uh, to yeah, get knowledge about uh, it, test supplements, functional medicine, but also to, uh, I'm pushing our programmer to make more and more tools for you in VMS so that it becomes uh, a better uh, tool for you to work with uh, so that it becomes your go-to tool in your uh, everyday uh, work with patients. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, see you soon. And thank you, Graham, for your uh, presentation. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye.